Derek the Vampire was something else. I admire them all now. Derek the Accountant Vampire. I mean, I can see how he must have been a really useful member of the team. I suppose even the undead must pay taxes. Do they pay taxes? Do you think that, that vampires do business? You know, like Nosferatu and Sons Limited? That'd be really cool, wouldn't it? Just imagine what you could write off against the company. I mean, coffins can't be cheap. I really can't. Imagine those vampires having cheap coffins. How long do you reckon a coffin actually lasts if you live in it? Do you have to have it old coffin-like and does it have to be coffin-sized? I mean, when does a coffin not be a coffin anymore? Do you get them in, like, king size and queen size? Do you think you can get double bed versions of coffins, you know, so you can share your coffin with the one you love? Do vampires love? I've got an awful lot of questions to ask vampires. I wonder if they can have, like, hot tubs or toilets in them. Who knew? Who knew I would be this interested in vampires? Up to now, I'd never been interested in any vampires. Now, due to my evening's experience, I was super interested in them. I would like to say that it was the beautiful gothic girl, I mean, vampire. I would like to say that was the reason why I was so interested in vampires. I mean... She was beautiful, all lumpy and lithe in the right areas. She had that element of coolness that none but a vampire can own. Do you think they are cool because they're dead and cold? Hmm. I mean, she was every 15-year-old boy geek gamer's dream. I have to admit, she was every 45-year-old werewolf's dream as well. Let's face it, she was everybody's kind of dream. Be it a good dream or a nightmare. I think for me, she may well have been part of a wet nightmare. They are the best kind of dream. And she would definitely be material for one. Scared into coming. Thrilling. Well, it wasn't the gothic girl that got me really interested in vampires. It wasn't really the fact that they were trying to kill me either. I was really interested in vampires now because of Derek. Derek, the accountant vampire. Even I could never imagine that vampires would need an accountant. No other reason. I was just really intrigued. I got back to my flat at 2 o'clock in the morning after murdering Derek in self-defence. Self-defence, obviously. It wasn't murder, it was self-defence, but it felt like murder because it had been so easy. After the attack, I had worked my way home, just pausing here and there to pester kill and eat. I mean, once you've changed into your werewolf shape or your wolf shape, you might as well use it. Where I live is lovely because there are many lovely little alleyways with lots of lovely little places to hide in the dark. I mean... Lovely little doesn't really describe the big black wolf that I am when I'm wandering home. I'm I'm not I'm I'm not little, I'm actually huge. From the tip of my toes to the tip of my ears, I stand about seven or eight feet tall. That's something in meters. You would think it would be pretty hard to hide as an eight foot tall wolf, but the back ways, the alleyways and the gills of Manchester do a wolf a good service. Also the people that you meet are very discreet. Oh that rhymed, especially at the time in the morning. Drinking, drugs and mental health issues mean that seeing an eight foot wolf cannot be real, so they just ignore it. I suppose a side note to that is those who don't ignore it die. As I got to my door I typed my pass key code into the stainless steel modern looking panel in the modern looking building to access the modern looking lift to my modern looking apartment. I got the idea of a passkey because I tended to lose the keys to my flat every time I transformed. Now, as you can imagine, that gets a little bit annoying and a little bit expensive. I am a very lucky wolf. I own a huge warehouse building next to the canal in Manchester. Now, some of you might have heard that this warehouse has many uses for this werewolf. I've chatted about them before. There are a couple of humans that I model myself on. That is when I'm being human. I found I have to do it to try and be part of real life. Now these humans I model myself on are actually fictional, so that must tell you how my brain works. Real humans could never be something that I could model myself on. They're a little bit... shit, are they not? Now the first is James Bond, come 007, licensed to kill and thrill. Sadly, I lost my very own license to kill when I left the fucking army. Again, if you've not read or heard the stories of my days in the military, you can find them all available on this podcast. Go listen. They are down in the description, apparently. Or you could just go and buy my book. In the army, I did some licensed killing for a change. I now just have a full-time license to thrill. I rightly or wrongly think that Bond is suave and sophisticated, so as a suave and sophisticated Englishman, I walk around much like Bond. Now, you might be wondering which actor that plays Bond I model myself on. I have to admit it's somewhere between Sean Connery and Daniel Craig. 
The other fictional character that I model myself on is Batman. Well, not actually Batman. I mean, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Actually, maybe not ridiculous. I am a wolf, man. I even have the costume, and it's a lot easier to change into than Batman's, I suppose. I model myself on Bruce Wayne, you know, the rich idiot who can have whatever he wants. Bruce got his money from his parents after they died. I got some money from my parents after they died. Not that much, to be honest. So they didn't give me the Bruce Wayne lifestyle. But over the years, with the murdering, the torturing, the gambling, the blackmail, the stealing, the thieving, the fraud and the feuds, I've made a shitload of cash. I mean, fucking loads. I suppose Bruce Wayne did it the right way. I mean, he got his money legally, judging by, you know, any businessman. He got people to work for him to build, design and make things. Do the press, the marketing and the selling. Stealing from those people their time to make his money for a tiny fraction of the amount he was making. That's the legitimate way, isn't it? You get other people to give you parts of their life in form of time for a small amount of money while you get the large part of the money that they make because you're the business owner. Fair, right? It's like slavery, but fucking worse. I did it in a very different way. Now, don't think that I'm a good person or doing things for the right reason, but I taxed the rich. It was not for teaching them any moral or ethical virtues. It was not to save the poor. I was no Robin Hood. I just stole the money off the rich because they got the fucking money. You can get money robbing poor people, but to get the kind of money that I like, I would have to rob a lot of poor people, and that would take too much time. I don't have that time to spend on lots of people, so focusing on those with lots of cash makes a lot more fiscal sense. When robbing people, robbing the rich with all that money takes a lot less time and effort for an excellent financial result. I also found that the rich and powerful are very protective of their respectable lives. The only problem is that they have the money to have less respectable lives. This means that blackmail, prostitution and the use of drugs can be easily associated with wealthy people who can afford it. And they can make the appropriate effort to hide it too. This can make the providers of those things that they wish to get disrespectable with incredibly rich i built my model empire on prostitution blackmail and drugs then moving that money into respectable and legitimate businesses i like running businesses where everyone else does the fucking work and i get the reward i also like being a criminal being a criminal it's easy for a natural psychopath like myself it is all based on the ability to make it about fear and violence. I have a massive propensity for those things. So criminality is straightforward. Psychopaths are so successful in this beautiful capitalist world. I was a working class Bruce Wayne, criminalising the rich not to be poor. Also, criminalising and blackmailing the rich gave me a lot of powerful friends. Well influential people that I could tell what to do. I don't think they'd class me as a friend. Obviously, no one pretends not to be my friend because that would be suicide. They fear me because I will always go one step further than the other person is willing to go. I killed the only woman I ever loved to ensure that she could never be used against me. I found that living without her would be better than anyone being able to use her to blackmail me, to threaten my power, to stop me from doing whatever I wish to do. That is the level that I am willing to go to, to be the most powerful. Having said all this, why have I told you my human form is based on two fictional characters? Well, they're both smooth sophisticated men they both have plenty of charisma money and weird power and the love of gadgets just like me why do i always get sidetracked in these stories sorry this is supposed to be about me hunting vampires is it not anyway my home is a large warehouse that has been split into five levels at the very top of the warehouse is my penthouse suite I would like to say it has beautiful views over Manchester. I can only say it has views over Manchester. Beautiful in Manchester, especially in a city Manchester, have no links. This top floor has an open plan where I live. Malcolm, my erstwhile servant, has his own flat down in the bowels of the warehouse. Well, 
A slave would be more an appropriate term for Malcolm. I own him. I have evidence of his propensity for child porn. I have proof of him loving children, but in the very wrong way. I will try and leave that for you not to imagine. So I have complete control over him and his life. You can read about him or listen about him in another podcast. The floor below my penthouse suite is my art gallery and studio. I am the greatest living artist that has ever lived. I'm not arrogant, it's true. My art is somewhat different from the norm though. I work with people as my palette. I have made other videos and other pieces about my artwork. You should know that the palettes that I use are always in the mood of red. The situations my art creates are discomforting for humans. I try to focus on artwork that passes comment on human society and passes comment on the weakness of your physicality. My studio is full of the living, the dead, and those that wish they were dead. It is a soundproofed and smell-proofed wonderful emporium to life and death. The rest of my home is full of the stuff I love. My clothes, my cars, my bikes, my material possessions. Don't let anyone tell you that material possessions are not important. The person that has never owned and driven the suits up 911 Porsche, they've no idea. So, I got home. I'd made my way to my lovely penthouse. Malcolm, as usual, was awake. I kept him high on cocaine and speed, which meant that he was almost always available for me to speak to. The coke and the amphetamine were an excellent way to keep him on side too. He was an addict, and I was his free supply. He was a fucked up Albert the Butler for the fucked up Bruce Wayne that I played. I told him about the night that had, and what had just happened. Then my posit was annoyed with the vampires like myself, so he sat and thought of a plan to try and find the bitch before she found us. I was going to retaliate. I should have lived by my maxim to retaliate first. I should have killed her and her brother on that fateful night in Tokyo. I'd been a bit of a dumbass, to be honest. I can admit that. I'm not always the clever, logical person that I portray. Okay, the logical, clever person that I try to portray. This would be a sit down around the war table. We would try to establish how on earth we were going to do this. At this moment, I had no idea how we would even find them. They were really good at finding me, but how on earth would I find them? I sat on my shiny white leather couch at my shiny white coffee table while Malcolm wandered about on my shiny white marble. The posit took the sofa. Apparently he'd met this bitch a few hundred years ago, so maybe he could offer some help to find them. We sat and stared at each other a while. The scotch was poured into my ice-cold glass. I like to speak to my posit aloud when we're together and free from outside listeners. It just seems a little bit more respectful to do this. I was now sitting in blue jeans and a white t-shirt and not relaxed but a little bit vexed to say the least. We were talking about how we would track this bunch of fang heads down. It was not going well and we quickly concluded that we had no idea how we would do it. That was suitably annoying. We had no idea where to start. We didn't know anyone's names really. I mean the vampires names. We had no idea where they would be. And because I was so self-centred and life was all about me, I knew nothing about vampires except what I'd learnt from the movies. I'd never really been interested in them before meeting Vampire Derek. Knowing what people had learned about werewolves from films and what bullshit that was, I guess that my state of knowledge about vampires from the same source would be pretty poor too. Malcolm was walking past when I was saying to the wolf, I've no idea where to look for a vampire. Malcolm stopped and looked at me and smiled. You want to find vampires, boss? He asked. I looked at him and, and then at the positive who looked as confused as a giant wolf sitting on a sofa can look confused. Uh, yeah? We need to find some vampires that attacked me a few nights ago. We, I nodded at the wolf, we're just trying to find out where we would find the fuckers. Uh, the underworld, obviously, he stated blithely. I did not really understand these three words. The underworld? Do you mean hell? I asked. I mean, these are real vampires that attack me, Malcolm. I've no idea if they go off to hell, but I'm pretty sure that I can't go there. I shook my head dismissively and picked up my glass to swish the alcohol around it before taking a deeply pissed off gulp. No, the nightclub. You know, the nightclub night at Jilly's on Oxford Street. I was halfway through my swallow as this registered. I turned my head again and looked at him in a somewhat 
well, I suppose strange manner. It wasn't it wasn't that his information was not helpful or, or that it was stupid. It was that Malcolm had this information and I wasn't really ready for that. He was always doing this kind of thing. You look at him and you would never think that he thought, never mind new shit. Okay, what what are you actually talking about, Malcolm? I asked with compassion. There's a golf night on a Friday at Jilly's and it's known to be, he went and did the fucking air quotes, vampire friendly. I did not understand what he meant by vampire friendly at this juncture. I know these twats have glamours that make people love them, but vampire friendly? They've a, a night where vampires are well, like, worshipped and people offer themselves to them. They, like, feed off people and, and people like it. You know, vampires, they love blood, but they love power and worship even more. They go in there and the crowd treat them like gods. They get offered all the young and beautiful as your smorgasbord of blood types, which they can choose from. They go because they get off on the fact that people give themselves willingly. It's a night for the old ones, as they call them, to party. The night is thinly disguised vampire wine tasting, the wine being... I interrupted him at this point as I knew what the fucking wine was. Okay, right, that's really interesting, Malcolm, but how do you know about this? I mean, I mean, how on earth do you know about this? Look at yourself, you're not like gothic or or what let me describe this wonderful human being he had shoulder length rusty ginger greasy hair his skin is pallid and his acne has acne and that acne has the acne scars of a squeezer and someone with no idea of personal hygiene however i have tried to teach him many times he wears glasses, but these are no ordinary glasses. They are those thick bottle-bottomed motherfuckers that are so heavy on his head that they, the steel aviator frames have created a permanent scar on the bridge of his nose. They weigh so much they spend a lot of time travelling down his conk to the tip. As they are constantly on the move, they are constantly pushed back to the groove in his head. Oh, and surprisingly, they were not held together by clear tape. A shocker. That is what you expected. No, these poor frames had been sat on and squished underneath his ass so many times that they are so warped that your attention is drawn to them and not the feckless face. That nose is bulbous and full of blackheads that the lack of washing mixed with overzealous sebum release promotes. He was a heavy drinker, but I soon beat that habit out of him because he could not function as a caretaker of my most valuable things when drunk. I replaced his love of whiskey with a love of cocaine, which means he now needs me to fulfil his habit. He will never let me down for many reasons, but the main one is that he is an addict to my drugs. This change in the drug of choice means that his nose is red and haemorrhage vessels are fading. They are being replaced with the sunken bulbous eyes of the coke fiend. He looks young for a man in his early thirties with acne and a baby face, so he's tried to grow a moustache and beard. I have to reiterate that he has tried to grow. It makes him look well. It makes him look like, well, he looks like he's tried to grow a beard. The shame of it is he would actually be quite good looking if he had an ability to groom himself and present himself. To add to this lack of sexiness, he has big red blemishes on either side of his nose. At first he thought it was eczema, then I brought home a doctor for dinner and they looked at his eczema. We found out that he had athlete's foot on his face. He had a fucking foot fungus on his face. The sad thing was he was feeding the fungus with moisturiser with which he was trying to treat the eczema, which he didn't have. His physique is very strange as well, tall and gangly with a pot belly. His limbs were like bits of string, his knuckles due to his posture were by his knees. He was a hunchback of sorts. There wasn't like a, a literal lump there, but his posture was so bad, he was so hunched because he had kyphosis of the upper spine. He was, I suppose, a hunchback though, like all the great egos of literature. He had considerable sway in his back just above his hips to match this, making his spine look like a squished S from the side, kyphosis at the top and lordosis at the bottom. The lordosis also promoted the little pot belly he had, making it stick forward in front of the man. He looked like a chimp in his upper body, a strange contrast to a pair of the longest legs you ever saw on a man. 
He looked like he was standing on stilts as his shin seemed overly long. Oh, and he had fuck off huge feet to add to this grotesque nature. He was a size 18. Sadly, what they say about men with enormous feet is not true. They don't always have a huge cock. He really did not. It was tiny. I mean, tiny. It was so small and he did no pubic grooming. So the poor little thing was lost deep in the shag pile of the red, hairy, massive pubes. He also had no idea of how to dress. The poor fucker had socks and sandals the first time I met him. Not only socks and sandals, but white socks and brown sandals. Well, they should have been white socks. They were no longer white. He had his dirty, socked, massive feet in the biggest pair of what we would call Jesus sandals anyone could imagine. Big brown leather sandals with big brass buckles. Yeesh, a herd of cows must have died to make those fuckers. I think to get trousers to fit correctly, he would have had to have them tailored to fit. That was not a thing that he would ever consider, so his grey nylon farrow trousers terminated well above his ankles. These pants were not, as we would say, as like kids as being half mass, but they were three-quarter length. I mean, it was a look, a real look. Oh, and he wore baggy shirts as a rule to try and hide the body beneath them. It didn't work. We haven't finished describing this unfortunate fuck. He also had several nervous tics that ruled his life. The constant push of the glasses up the nose, even when they were not slipped, and he was incredibly blinky. And they were just two of them. I had to get rid of the other. That was his hands would often be down the front of his trousers, rummaging there in his crotch. We had to stop that one. It made me feel uncomfortable when we were speaking. Let's finish it with the final straws that the awful God he believed in and prostrated himself in front of had given him. His voice and his mannerisms made him a target for everyone. He was fucking perfect for me. The ideal guy to manipulate by the perfect God. Which was me. He worshipped at the altar of will and was loyal and particularly good at his job. So a slave to me he was, oh, and a huge sexual pervert to boot. All in all, he wasn't very gothic. You know me, boss. I'm a huge perv, so I smell anything kinky within a hundred square miles. The club is a scene for blood play, which is a kink that I have an extreme liking for. Well, you know me, I like stuff like that, he said proudly. The people there are called fang hags. Do you get it? You know, they get fag hags who hang around gay men. So what they've cleverly done is subsume that name and call themselves fang hags. You know, even the guys call them that because they're all androgynous and fuck. I turned to my positive, looked at me confused and shrugged his wolfy shoulders and laughed. Always good to have a massive perv in the household. It seems like our only lead. I think that we have a date in the underworld tomorrow night. He started laughing hysterically then. The best thing about this is that there's a dress code to enter and you're going to have to fucking wear it. That'll cause you more pain than the vampires ever did. I can't wait to see you goth it up, Will. He continued to giggle because he was right. I swallowed the last of my scotch and slammed the glass on the table. Fuck me sideways. Thanks for listening. That's the end of the episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you did and you want to support the show, there is a support the show link in the description. Also, there's a book there. There's my Twitter handle if you want to hear me twatter. And there is a Facebook group that now has four people in it. Woo! We've gone from one to four. And I would like to thank those four people so much. You are wonderful and I apologise for the things that I actually put on that group. It's not my fault. I'm a werewolf. Okay, love you. Bye.